Reading from Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 through 18. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seventh and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They'll bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They'll eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish His purpose by agreeing to give the beasts their power to rule until God's word are fulfilled. The woman you saw is that great city that rules over the kings of the earth. And now for my introduction to this chapter. Come with me and I will introduce you to the harlot. She is drunk, not with intoxicants, but with the blood of saints. She is on a scarlet-colored beast. No one can take a picture of her hierarchy without seeing this color. The Catholic Church has blasphemed and held out a cup, luring people into sin by her indulgences. The ten kingdoms of Europe helped the Catholic Church who opposed God's people. 
Many people were bamboozled and hoodwinked by their this religion of whom God declares does not have eternal life. It was such a riddle and mystery that even the apostle wondered with great admiration. John tells us that the beast he saw was the ten kingdoms of Europe and that they would give the Catholic Church their power for a period of time and then hate her. She would make war with the Lamb and his followers, but in the final analysis, the ten kingdoms of Europe would finally bring her down. God's word was and is being fulfilled. Hallelujah. Daniel the prophet declared, quote, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. End of quote, Daniel 7.25 She claims the power to make and unmake kings. She changed the laws respecting the Lord's Supper. She set up images. In 1075, Pope Gregory VII declared all clerical marriages invalid. This was the greatest mass divorce in history. She changed times and laws. She changed our calendar. In 1518, Pope Gregory changed our calendar ten days. She changed the Ten Commandments. In general, she claims absolute control of all religion. The last verse of the chapter tells us that the, the woman is a city which rules over the earth. If this isn't Rome then please tell me what city he had in mind. And now for our exposition of this chapter verse by verse, beginning with verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. What a word picture! The scriptures represent her under the image of a corrupt, idolatrous, and abandoned woman. This city reigns over the kings of the earth, and scholars are universally agreed that the city is Rome. Those familiar with Old Testament prophecy will know how often the term fornication and adultery are used to describe unfaithfulness of a city. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21, Isaiah said, See how the faithful city has become a harlot. She once was full of justice, and righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Jeremiah writes long ago, you broke off your yoke and tore off your bonds. You said, I will not serve you. Indeed, on every high hill and under every spreading to tree, you lay down as a prostitute. Jeremiah 2 and 20. Again, Jeremiah wrote, If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and marries another man, should he return to her again? Would not the land be completely defiled, but you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers? Would you now return to me, declares the Lord? Jeremiah 3 and verse 1. Again Jeremiah wrote, During the reign of King Josiah the Lord said to me, Have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She has gone up on every hill, and under every spreading tree, and has committed adultery there. Jeremiah 3 and verse 6. Again Jeremiah wrote, I gave faith, faithless Israel her certificate of divorce, and sent her away because of her adulteries. Yet I saw her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery. Jeremiah 3. And verse 8. 
Notice in this chapter that God speaks of this uh, city, this woman, as being uh, adulterous. He says that she was the great prostitute, even the King James Version calls her the great whore. Allow me to tell you a little bit uh, about a pope by the name of Casa. The year is 14 and 15. The date is February the 17th. It is at a council and they, according to, I'm reading here from this book, says they had 1,500 wandering prostitutes. They accused this man of crimes. The bill read something like this, ranging from simony to adultery, fornication, murder, perjury, sacrilege, and gluttony. On down a few lines later, it says that 200 or so married ladies and widows and girls he kept in his stable of pleasures. The clerics and laymen he had seduced by chosen prostitutes. Is it any wonder then that God would accuse this woman that rules over the kings of the earth as being guilty of prostitution? Allow me to read to you uh, a document of Byzantine ambassadors asking four questions of the, the Roman priests before they would allow them to be priests in, the, in their church. Question number one, have you sodomized a boy? Question number two, have you fornicated with a nun? Question three, have you sodomized any four-legged animal? Question four, have you committed adultery? Now, if they weren't practicing this, why would these questions even come up? Let me tell you a little bit about John the 19th, the year. 1033. He took his 12 year old son called Theophylact, had papal clothes made to fit him, lift him bodily into the papal throne, had him consecrated uh, as Pope Benedict the Ninth. Benedict uh, was a bisexual. The bi- uh, the the book says that he sodomized animals and ordered murders and dabbled in witchcraft and Satanism. Later on in the history book it said he converted uh, the Lateran palace into the best brothel in Rome. Well, I think I've read enough from the history books to tell you that this unfaithful woman is called a prostitute. In verse 15 of the Revelation, he says that the many waters are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues over which she rules. Verse 2. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth aligned themselves with the Roman Catholic Church and became partners with her. Nations were so intoxicated with her power that they could not see the truth. And she is still even to this day deceiving millions. Chapter 18 of this book and in verse 23 declares that by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Could anything be more plain? Verse 3, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert, 
There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. I'm going to look at some of the Pope's claims and see if they are blasphemous. Number one, he claims to be the head of the church. Well, how could that possibly be? Because the Bible says in Colossians 1.18 that Christ is the head of the body, the church, that is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so in everything he might have supremacy. What blasphemy is it for any mortal man to claim what belongs only to God? Secondly, the Pope claims that he's the judge of the living and the dead. Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 15, page 126. This is some more of his blasphemy. The Scriptures teach just the opposite. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing in His kingdom, I give this charge, wrote Paul in Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Third, she claims authority above all and subject to none. Pius the Sixth in Synthical, number 65. Number four, Leo the Thirteenth said in his encyclical 304, We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Number five, she claims to be the vicar of Christ. Catholic Dictionary, page 258. And the Pope has this inscription on his crown. Vicarious Fili D. Translated, this means Vicar of the Son of God. It is interesting to learn that when we add up the Roman numeral values of this inscription, we have two V's equaling, equaling ten, six I's equaling six, one L equals fifty, one C equals 100, 1 D equals 500. Totaling them up, 6, 6, 6. The mark of the beast. Number 6. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. The Pope is, as it were, God on earth sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief of kings, having plenitude of power, to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction not only of the earth, but also of the heavenly kingdom. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, and interpret even divine laws. Lucilus Ferreris, Volume 6, page 626. I offer the following quotes from official Catholic books to prove that she fulfills that which was spoken by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now that's what the Word of God says that he would do, and I say to you that she has done exactly that. Listen to the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 666. He is the keeper of the keys, the judge of the living and the dead, and sits on the throne of justice with power to extirpate all iniquity. He is the head of the church, which is one and stainless and not a many-headed monster and has full divine authority to pluck out and tear down to build up and plant. Let not the king imagine that he has no superior, is not subject to the highest authority of the church. End of quote. Again, <clears throat> she says in the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 15, page 126, Now therefore we declare, say, determine, and pronounce, 
that for every human creature it is necessary for salvation to be subject to the authority of the Roman pontiff. Now can you imagine such blasphemy as this? No, I do not believe that I have to be subject to some Roman potentate in order to have salvation. I do have to be subject to my God and Jesus Christ, His Son. Again, Pius the Eleventh said in his Synthical Light of Truth, page 5, The Roman pontiff has from on high an authority which is supreme above all others and subject to none. Pope Leo XIII, in his great encyclical letters, page 304, said, We, the Pope, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Now, I don't believe that for one moment, that she holds the place of God Almighty. Pope Leo XIII, in his great encyclical letters, page 193, said, But the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds, therefore, requires together with a perfect accord in the one faith, complete submission and obedience of will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. What blasphemy! Again, I'd like to quote the following. Wherefore, resting on plain testimonies of sacred writings, and adhering to the plain and expressed decrees both of our predecessors, the Roman pontiffs and the general councils, we renew the definition of the Ecumenical Council of Florence of 1439, in virtue of which all the faithful of Christ must believe that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff possesses the primacy over the whole world, and that the Roman Pontiff is the successor of the Blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, and is the true Vicar of Christ, and the head of the whole church, and the father and teacher of all Christians, and that full power was given to him in Blessed Peter to rule, feed, and govern the universal church by Jesus Christ our Lord as contained in the Acts of the General Councils and in the Sacred Canons. Hence we teach and declare that by the appointment of our Lord, the Roman pontiff possesses a superiority of ordinary power over all other churches, and that this power of jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff, which is truly episcopal, is immediate, to which all of whatever right of dignity, both pastors and faithful, both individually and collectively, are bound by their duty of hierarchical subordination and true obedience to submit not only in matters which belong to faith and morals, but also in those that pertain to the discipline and government throughout the world, so that the church of Christ may be one flock under one supreme pastor through the preservation of the unity both of communion and profession of the same faith with the Roman pontiff. This is the teaching of Catholic truth, from which no one can deviate without loss of faith and of salvation. End of quote. Now that's found in the dogmatic decrees of the Council of Trent, page 159 and 160. The same wording is found in the teachings of the Catholic Church, page 143 and 144. And again I quote, There is nothing strange in attributing to the Roman pontiff as the vicar of him, who is the earth and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell therein, the fullest authority to lay bare, a just cause moving him not only the spiritual, but also the material sword, and so to transfer sovereignties, break scepters, and remove crowns. Now, that's found in the Catholic Dictionary, page 258. How much more blasphemy do you need to hear? 
I believe this is enough to convince any honest, Bible-believing Christian, anyone who is honest in their own heart, will see that she is filled with blasphemy. Verse 4, The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. It is notable that the Catholic Church at her Mass has a golden cup. It is contrary to Catholic law to have anything other or to use anything other than a golden cup. The Catholic Church has untold wealth. Nino Lu Ballo says, quote, On the question, How rich is the Pope? Suffice it to say that it has become increasingly clear he doesn't even know himself. End of quote. Again, he says, quote, One of the greatest fiscal powers in the world. End of quote. That's found in the Vatican Empower, page 8. She owns water companies, telephone companies, gas companies, breweries. Quote, One could also mention the church's invaluable collection of antiques, gold and silver crosses, Byzantine jewelry, altar pieces, furniture, chalices, and other vessels, the 500,000 aged volumes and 60,000 old manuscripts in the Vatican Library are also part of the church's patrimony. Because none of the treasures will ever be put on the market, it is folly even to hazard a guess as to the cumulative worth of these items, but conceivably they could bring a billion dollars under an auctioneer's gavel, page 13. Mr. Lobello describes in fascinating detail Vatican's investment in real estate. One-third of Rome is owned by the Holy See, electronics, plastics, airlines, and chemical and engineering firms. He also gives evidence that the Vatican is highly involved in Italian banking and that it has huge deposits in foreign banks. Some of these accounts are in America, many are in Switzerland. The Vatican financiers prefer numbered Swiss accounts because they allow them to maintain anonymity when gaining control of foreign corporations. The Bible said she held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. She makes large offers and absolutions, positively allures men into sin. Abominable things and adulteries are her stock and trade. According to her priest, she doesn't even break the vow of chastity by adultery. Now, you may not have heard of this, but it's a book that the priests have. It's called The Explanation of Catholic Morals, page 149. And I quote, All celibates are not chaste. Celibacy is not necessarily chastity by a large majority, unless something other than selfishness suggests this choice of life. The word is apt to be a misnomer for profligacy. And one who takes the vow of celibacy does not break it by sinning against the sixth commandment, of which we know of as the seventh. He is true to it until he weds. That's found in the Explanation of Catholic Morals, page 149. Now you can see then that they can commit any kind of fornication, adultery, any type of of uh, homosexuality, pedophilia, and, and still not break their celibacy and still claim that they are chaste. No wonder God calls her 
the woman dressed in purple and scarlet and glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls and holding a golden cup filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Verse 5. This title was written on her forehead. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Her doctrine of purgatory, transubstantiation, relics, miracles, signs, sacraments, and so forth are all mysterious and unfathomable. It is mysterious how anyone could be so zealous and profess to be Christian and still practice these sins. Verse 6, I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. When I read about it, I too was astonished. Consider the persecution and death of the Waldings, the Pope's war against the Bohemian brethren, the massacre of St. Bartholomew, the martyrdom of John Callus, the Inquisition in which 150,000 died, John Wycliffe, John Huss, Jerome of Prague, Tyndale, Luther, persecutions in Germany, France, Scotland, England, Ireland, persecution of the Quakers, and then came the order of the Jesuits in 1540, where it is supposed that 900,000 persons perished through papal cruelty. My dear friends, do you think that she is not blood, drunk with the blood of saints and prophets? Is there any other institution on the face of the earth that more likely fits the above description? Verse 7, Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. When you first read the history of Roman Catholicism, you'll wonder with great admiration. You'll be amazed beyond measure. Her acts will astound and perplex you beyond measure. I have her own books, her own encyclopedias written by her own priest. God has made her confess her own sins. Verse 8. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. You see, the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. The dragon, which was pagan Rome, gave to him, papal Rome, his seat, which was Rome, and his power, which was absolute rulership and great authority. The Vatican occupies the original gardens of Nero. Long ago God said, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Revelation 18, 4 and 5. Verse 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Now we know that Rome sits on seven hills. Thus the seven hills city is a representation of the seven forms of government that she has passed through. In a book titled Rome and Her Empire, on page 40, the caption at the top of the page is Seven Hills. It has the names of all of the seven hills of Rome and a picture of them. 
on page 44 of the same book. The caption at the top of the page is Seven Kings. And then there is the picture of all seven of them as they were found on the coin struck during that period of time. Verse 10. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, but when he comes, he must remain for a little while. The remaining part of this book, we will talk extensively about the red dragon. It is therefore necessary that we identify who or what he is. The dragon was the standard of pagan Rome in the 3rd century. The best way to explain the meaning of the dragon with seven heads and ten horns is to let the prophet Daniel tell us the meaning. Here is what Daniel has to say about it. Quote, After that in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Daniel 7, verse 7. Again, quoting from Daniel chapter 7, Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast which was different from all the others and most terrifying. With its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. End of quote. Daniel 7, verse 19. Now, my dear friends, Daniel wanted to know the truth. Are you anxious to know the truth about the fourth beast with seven heads and ten horns? If you are, then let Daniel tell you who it is. Daniel 7, verse 23. Hang on. Quote, He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole world, trampling it down and crushing it. End of quote, Daniel 7.23. Now that should forever settle who the fourth beast is. In Daniel chapter 2, he speaks of four kingdoms and identifies them. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the fourth as the Roman Empire. It is stated in both Daniel and the Revelation that this empire would have seven heads, and as we examine the empire, we notice that it passed through seven heads. Just recently, I read another encyclopedia on this very subject of Rome, and it listed the seven heads of government that Rome had passed through. Here they are. I lay them out for you. One. It was ruled over by seven kings for about 200 years. 2. It was ruled over by councils. That's the second head. 3. It was ruled over by tribunes. That's the third head. 4. It was ruled over by decimbers. That's the fourth head. 5. It was ruled over by dictators. 6. It was ruled over by 65 emperors who ruled in Rome for five centuries. And seventh, it was ruled over by the ex of Ravenna who ruled for more than a century. Now, how did John know that five are fallen? One, two, three, four, five. But he says one is and one is yet to come. Oh, my. John was right, wasn't he? The Word of God is always right. Thus, seven, this seven-headed beast has ten horns, or the ten kingdoms over which she ruled for 1260 years. We identify them as the ten kingdoms of Europe. 
And I have looked at the maps, and there they are, as plain as day. There's the German Empire, Austrian Empire, Belgium, Holland, France, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Portugal, and Great Britain. And she ruled over these ten horns. Verse 11. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seventh and is going down to his destruction. The beast was when Rome was in power. The beast was not when Rome fell. The beast yet is when it reappeared in Roman Catholicism. Out of the seventh head of the Roman Empire, or the exarches of Ravenna, who ruled for a short time, about a century, came the eighth king, the Pope, who's going into perdition. Verse 12. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour receive authority as kings along with the beast. At the time that this book, the book of Revelation, was written, none of these ten kings or kingdoms had received any power yet. We identified them as the ten kingdoms of Europe. This verse affirms that when John was here, that Europe was not yet divided into ten kingdoms. Verse 13. They have purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. These powers aided the false church in her religious wars. During the Dark Ages, she used these kings and their armies to destroy heretics. Remember, what she calls heretics, we call Christians. Verse 14, They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because He's Lord of lords and King of kings, and with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. Now reading from Revelation 13, verse 7, He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And He was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. There wasn't a kingdom in this world that she didn't rule over. She ruled over the then known world. And she made war against Christian people. And she overcame them. Now back to the sixth verse of chapter 17 says, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. I'm flabbergasted with it. Are you? Rome's long history was marked with the shedding of the blood of saints. Can anyone doubt that this belongs to the popes? In 1208, Pope Innocent III warred against the Waldings, and in which one million people were killed. From the beginning of the Jesuits in 1540 to 1580, 900,000 were destroyed. 150,000 people perished by the Inquisition in 30 years. In the lowlands, 50,000 people were hanged, beheaded, burned alive, or buried alive for the crime of Christianity. Within 38 years from the edict of Charles V, 18,000 were executed. The, tr the popes tried to put down the Reformation in Germany and Switzerland. The slightest acquaintance of the history of the popes will convince us that this verse refers to them. The great historian W. E. H. Leakey says, quote, The Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a complete knowledge of history. End of quote. Some historians have estimated that the persecuting hands of Rome have been redded, reddened by the blood of 50 million saints. 
I doubt that anyone can come close to the exact number. In Revelation, she is known as the Babylon, Babylon the Great, or better known to us as the Union of Church and State. The church was driven into the wilderness for 1260 long years, and during this long, dark period of history, she dealt with a high hand. During this time, she made and unmade kings. She changed the laws respecting the Lord's Supper. She set up images, enacted celibacy of the clergy. In 1075, Pope Gregory VII declared all clerical marriages invalid. This was the greatest mass divorce in all of history. She changed the Ten Commandments. In general, she claims absolute control of all religion. 